So um, it's very interesting watching all the talks earlier. You know, we talked about, David Kessler was talking about actually design sort of operating through state and through politics. It's not my cup of tea. I don't like spending too much time around politicians, and also it's a very laborious project. Um, but you know, when, you, when you think about what designers do every day, you know, we design stuff to seduce people, to, to get, get those things off, off shelves into, into baskets. That's, that's generally what we're, you know, we're involved with in some way, shape, or form, whether we're designing the products or the, or the packaging or the graphics or the identities or the whatever. So just to, just to frame, the, frame, frame our little uh, discussion here, the, the, uh, and, and knowing that a lot of the people here are designers, you know, frame it in a, in a, in a brief, in a, in a process that they're all, they're all used to. So if that's true, you know, if we're involved in that, in that stuff, maybe the, the most potent contribution we can make to the world is, is, is turning that, that skill into something. It's using that, that ability to create seduction, to seduce people towards things that are more sustainable. So, and I think in order to do so, then we, we've got to think beyond just design and making things look great. We need to understand that, that you know, what Freud gave us a long time ago is this understanding that, that we live in a world of symbols, and that's, that's what motivates us, that's what moves us, ultimately. And, and as designers, we have to, we have to engage, that, uh, engage with the world in that way if we, if we want to move things forward. And that's why seduction is so important, uh, because symbols are, 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 you know, are, are the drivers, really, of, of, of desire. So a little bit of insight as well to, to, to follow our common, common uh, uh, path here. I'm a pretty kind of ordinary individual who grew up watching stuff like this, and I still watch it in the cinema. You know, it's not really the sort of the stuff we're supposed to like. You know, I feel a bit embarrassed, but you know, this is core to the sort of masculine identity, you know, and core to the, the fantasies that I have about you know, being a potent human being and, and you know, being rich and successful and, and uh, fearless and, and uh, you know, violent at times when necessary. Um, and, um, you know, I just can't, I, I'm not going to ignore that. I'm not going to say that that's not the case because I think, you know, let's, let's just accept that it's a messy reality. It's a better starting point. It's interesting that, you know, we all sort of aspire to be further and further away from other people, live in big houses with massive gardens and never speak to anybody. It's a strange, it's a strange set of aspirations, but that's, that's kind of how it is, right? You know, we want big fat boats. And you can see why those things, why that's all a, a you know, massive conflict with, with where, where things are going. You can see why these, these, these fantasies are, 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 you know, are harmful. Uh, it's interesting, actually, that James Bond emerged from Ian Fleming's uh, uh, psychiatric s sessions. Um, you know, where they, they, he was asked to sort of find an outlet for his crazy fantasies, and James Bond was the, was the consequence. But it's, it's interesting, that, you know, why that's such a sort of potent vehicle, right? You know, I love you know, like the sound of a V12 and sitting in that Ferrari and driving along at crazy speeds. You know, like very seduced by that, and we all are. You know, I think it's we just have to accept that that's the case. So, you know, and this is a battle, right? We're, we're, we're you know, we're, we're trying to present alternatives, alternatives um, but this is the competition. You know, this is it's the it's the wall of a teenager's bedroom. You know, what what what, what images, what 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 visions, what dreams are on are on that bedroom wall. You know, and until we're present, until new visions, new realities are, are you know are operating at that level symbolically, driving things forward and away from these kinds of these kinds of uh, symbols, then you know it's going to be a, a difficult battle. And yes, the politicians and the legislators can help, but you know that that's how that's a big part of how how we can change things. And obviously, design is a part of all these things I've showed you. So looking at change, you know, we we understand that designers have always had a Designers and design thinking and, and philosophies have always been kind of, you know, when you think about sort of classic, iconic design, you know, the moment that those things happen are as much to do with the design as the design itself. You know, you can't extract, you know, deco from the era that it represented. You can't extract the design and the aesthetics from, you know, from what was happening at the time. And what, you know, what, what that represented. I mean, Concord is one of Britain's sort of, you know, it's, it, it's, we hold it incredibly dear to us, the fact that we, you know, we actually did something with the French and, and um, you know, came up with something that was, you know, a symbol of progress, you know, a symbol of, of, of advancement of, of humankind. And it, it wasn't just chucked into a, an aeroplane. It, it manifested in something inspiring and beautiful, you know. And that, that's, that's, what makes it, that's what makes it a classic. Same with the, 
you know, the iPod, iPod wasn't just a cool design. It was a, it was a, it was a spectacular design that, that happened at a moment when, that marked a, a huge transition in the way that we consume. You know, those, you can't extract those things together, uh, you know, from, from one each other, from each other. So this is a piece about framing. So it's the last part of the little insight section. And this, this relates back, it's related to Freud actually, because it's uh, Bernays, who was Freud's nephew, I think, around a PR agency in, in New York. And um, he, man he masterminded the, 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 uh, the campaign to get women in America smoking. And the way he did that was, was uh, um, basically kind of framed smoking as torches of freedom and looked for you know, women's movements, you know, th things happening in, in that world and you know, photographed them smoking and made sure that whenever those stories were covered, cigarettes always featured and these women were always sort of associated with smoking and the cigarettes themselves were always, or where, where possible, presented as torches of freedom, as symbols of, of, of that change. So, so not only in, in, you know, as designers and sort of dealing with the objects, but also dealing with the framing and the stories and the context is, is very, very powerful. Um, so then, you know, working that into our solution here in our little workshop um, here in Amsterdam. Um, so what can we, you know, what, what, what can be done about that and how can we sort of throw that back and how can we turn that into something from, from a sort of observation into, into, into action? You know, here's something, when you look at James Bond and, you know, the fast car is this sort of kind of symbol of, 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 of potency. Then, if you, you know, if you want to change people's attitudes to, to more sustainable technologies and electric cars, one. I mean, I came in a came in a Nissan Note. Thank you very much for for um, sorting that out. It was a great great ride, but it's a very uninspiring design. It's not exciting at all. It's not sexy. It's very, you know, anodyne. It's nothing cool about it. This is the the Tesla Model S. You know, Tesla. It has to be a new a new company to to. Do something so sexy because Nissan and you know and, and Toyota and those guys they're sort of scared to make them sexy because actually they don't want them to succeed. It, it's not in their interest for, for these alternatives to work, so they can't let them be potent. So so it's you know it's taken uh, Tesla to, to to make that happen. Does my voice really sound that gruff? <laughs> um, I take a hint though. Um, so, you know, designing desire is, is, is clearly what, you know, one of the things. I mean, obviously, there's a million things we can do, but it feels like it's something that we, you know, we have a real, you know, strong role to play. This is Nest. I met these guys, actually. They're, they're hopefully coming into Europe. I just want one as a consumer. You know, a beautiful device that reduces my energy consumption. That's also cool in a kind of store in its own right. That looks beautiful, so I stick it on my wall, and I'm actually more likely to use it because it's in my environment, because it looks nice. Etc. 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 You can see it's being, you know, it's solving a bunch of design problems, but actually, in doing it so so elegantly, it also becomes a, a symbol of how good that change can feel. So it's not just, you know, kind of compensate. You know, it's not just doing a good job of, of compensating for the losses that you get through shifting you know, the way that you consume. It's making that joyful. It's making it a, a feel like a step forward, an advancement, which suddenly kind of changes the whole dynamic. So this is a secret light bulb thing that I didn't want to talk about earlier. Um, a few years ago, we, you know, I was just looking at these things, and um, I just felt like it's weird that those things are so utilitarian. You know, we're being pushed. You know, there's lots of imagination in the marketing space trying to excite us about using these things, but the objects are still hideous. Like, you know, surely we should address this on a product level. I think, you know, talk, listening to Caroline's talk earlier about, about the, the relationship between food and cities was interesting about distribution because, you know, objects have those same forces. You know, and the reason why these things become sort of neutered at the end of these chains is, is, is sort of arbitrary to a certain extent, but it doesn't get fixed because it operates at such a massive scale. But then you, you look at these, you, you look at what artists do with neon, and you can just see that, you know, there's a real delight in, in using tubes of light. You know, light is, is poetic. It doesn't really only exists for a second, it's not something you can capture. Well, you can, and you get a massive shock and you could die. Um, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't try that. So, so I just felt like, well, this is weird, you know, we have these two kind of polar opposites, and obviously there's something, something has, to, has to live in between. And then really this is a, as the kind of, as the, as the, as the core of the, the idea, which is, you know, when I started thinking about it, I was thinking, wow, this is just ridiculous. You know, we have this thing that's a symbol of, of ideas, and yet it's completely absent of any imagination and innovation. You know, it, 
there's an object here, there's a story here, and there's a symbol in, in this opportunity, there's a symbol to, to address that, but address this much bigger issue about, about the kind of the world's sort of inability to, to, you know, to adapt and to understand this, you know, the, the, the need for a new dynamic. So we made this, this is 150 pounds worth of neon sign bending. We made a coat hanger model and, and took it to the neon sign shop and asked them to make it. We faked the light bulb. We took some pictures and sent it to the press and you know, this is a, the Sunday Times and it got lots of, got lots of uh, attention. Uh, and then three years later this pops out which is a production model called the Pluman 001. Uh, which we're selling, we're selling out, I don't know, you might have seen it around. We sell it here, we sell it all over the world. Uh, we're just a small company, five, five people based in London. Um, and you know, here it is, and this is the baby, the baby Plumen 01 on the right there. Um, and you know, obviously what we're trying, you know, even though it's a very simple thing and you know, it actually makes it manageable for us, we're not funded, so we, you know, we run it on, a, you know, we bootstrap it. Um, but it, it's sort of beautifully simple in a way for us, and I think, I think that, that, again, back on the symbolic kind of potency of it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it works really, really well for us. Obviously, we need to, because we need to sort of create, you know, make it real, and I think back to the last point, sort of normalise it in the world, because statements are fine, you know, art pieces are fine in the gallery, but, you know, they're much more powerful when they penetrate reality, and, that, and that's, that has to be about normalising. Um, the object, and also, you know, starting to create associations and connections so that people start to understand how they might use it and how it might connect and resonate in their spaces. And also, to, you know, to start using sort of aspirational language, you know, shiny surfaces and, you know, these beautiful things. It's funny, actually, we're in the, the green room upstairs and there's a whole line of light bulbs around the mirrors, you know, for sort of fancy celebrity types to feel, feel important. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, a, that's probably a in a few kilowatts of energy being sucked up, up right up there. Um, these are just these are things. These are just people making things now, and we, we find these things on the internet, which is a great a great joy. And this is this is a sort of happening where you know we got a, an email saying that it's featuring in a Tesla store in in a pop up store in Frankfurt, which gave us a lot of joy as well. So so I think that's just as a quick glimpse on a, on a kind of object level, what you know how that sort of you know, belief in trying to, you know, trying to shift uh, the object and, and create, you know, seduction um, into, into better practice, into better consumption um, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, is a, is a powerful tool. But also, you know, as I touched on earlier with the, with the, the, um, the, the torches of, of freedom, we also have the, the ability to reframe. So this is, I mean, this is just something that happens anyway in the, in the you know, in the, in the States, which is called uh, hypermiling. I don't know if you've heard about it. So it's about getting obsessive, about getting the maximum uh, mileage out of your car. So this is a guy who, you know, turns, to, you know, turns the, uh, the, the key off whenever, you know, whenever he's running down a hill, uh, tends not to put the brake on when he's turning around the corners and all these types of things. But what's interesting is it's turning what would otherwise be considered very sort of, you know, hippie-ish behavior into something competitive. Which I think is really interesting because as soon as you turn it competitive, then the, again the whole kind of dynamic changes. And when you're talking about desire, that suddenly kind of sparks up this 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 motivation that was otherwise absent. You know, it was finding its it was finding its dreams in V12s, and now it's finding its dreams in in, in Priuses and whatever's going to give them the, the biggest mileage. It's an interesting. It's a, it's a subtle flip, but potentially really powerful. There's other examples of this as well. This is Sugru. Uh, it's a little company based in Hackney in London, um, run by a girl called Jane. It's the red stuff. It's not the phone in the middle. That's made by a company called Apple. Um, but what's interesting is you know, when she reports, it, like, it, it's just getting wider and wider distributed now. She was a product designer and decided she didn't want to make products. She wanted to make enabling substances. She came up with this idea of Sugru, which is like a glue come femo come thing. You, you, know, you mold it and then it sets. It's sticky. But it also has structural... Um, rigidity as well, so it's really useful for a bunch of things. But lots of people adapt their, you know, their, their devices and make the devices better. But actually, she reports that a lot of people feel this incredible pressure when they cross that threshold to to better these otherwise sacred devices. You know, how dare you say that that you can better Apple? You know, how dare we say that as a consumer that you might you might be able to improve their device? It's strange, but as soon as they cross that sort of threshold, suddenly they feel this incredible sense of empowerment. It's interesting that a little kind of gummy substance could have that effect. 
This is one of the Poke products, which is we just relaunched uh, this year because it's 10 years old now. It's called the Global Rich List, and this is a free reframing application. All it does is it, it, you know, we were conscious that the Times Rich List and the Forbes Rich, Forbes rich List, they just reinforced what we already think, which is that we're poor, um, and that there's these other guys over here who are having a great time, and we're, we're screwed, right? Um, knowing full well that actually when you consider all the people in the world, that's not true. Um, so, so all this does is just, it just draws a line top to bottom and sticks you on it where you are, by, by, you know, by your salary or wealth. And it's a, you know, it's a very, it's a very powerful tool. It's had, a, you know, with no kind of media support or anything, a million people have been through in, in the last couple of weeks, because, you know, they feel very energised by it. But, but also, it's incredibly enlightening and empowering, and also is likely to lead to them behaving in a different way and thinking about their wealth in a different way and thinking about giving in a different way. This is also, I can't let this run because I run out of time. Um, I, ca I can't, I can't. It's four minutes long. No, no. Wait. I'll. I'll uh, I'll just run on to the, um, uh, the, the, it was actually the thing that came before the light bulbs, but I think it was an interesting, interesting story. So in, the, in, the, uh, in John's sort of small bet um, uh, fr framing, then, then I'd made a very small bet a long time ago, um, which was a response to mobile phones. So with Poke, we worked with Orange for 10 years. I was very conscious about mobile phones and just thought, like, this had got ridiculous. You know, they got so small I couldn't use them. And they had all these functions kind of buried in, the, in, the, in these devices, and they were completely throwaway. You bought it the first day, and then day five, you got a chip. Day, you know, day 10, you hated this device. It was not built to last. You know, this kind of idea of, of built-in obsolescence had become this kind of ridiculous kind of cartoon. Um, so I thought, well, you know, ridiculous cartoons, I know what to do about that. Uh, and created, you know, and hacked this together in an afternoon and bought the thing off eBay and, and uh, you know, and, and rewired it to a, to a hands-free kit and made this device and walked around the streets and people laughed their heads off and thought, this is interesting. Um, and then took some pictures and then ended up on the front of an Italian sort of fashion magazine. <laughs> and, and then eventually the New York Times and, and uh, you know, global press and TV all over the world for this, this, this kind of dumb little thing which... You know, which in a way, it, did, it, it sort of, whilst it was a, you know, it was a kind of an art project, and we lost interest in it really as the light bulbs came in because they're much, much more interesting really. But, but it kind of gave us a really strong sense, and it was interesting actually as well, well looking at Mario's stuff, which I really loved, particularly where you know where where the, she was starting to make products that were kind of taking the piss out of what the non-meat products were doing. You know, it's, it was like this it was an artistic kind of critique of, of objects, but they were themselves consumable objects in their own right which I thought was really, really interesting. And again, you know, coming from an art background, not wanting to have my work and ideas in sort of neutralised territory of a gallery, that kind of out there in culture, I thought that, that you know, uh, Mario's stuff was, was really interesting. But, it, you know, it, was, it connects a lot with what we were, what we were doing with this thing. And I think, it, you know, even though, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the um, you know, the, this thing has moved on, we, we, we learned some really interesting things. One thing that we, we were very passionate about was this idea that, you know, built it. You know, it could be used this as a way of just talking about reversing the the, the tendencies of built-in obsolescence. So that term was coined a long time ago when, you know, it was established that obviously you'd want to build build objects that wouldn't last, so they'd be replaced, and that would fuel commerce. That was a good thing post-war, right? It's just not a great thing anymore. One of the things that was 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 true of these old handsets was actually that they, you know, they wore in. They didn't they didn't wear out, so they kind of improved over time. That was one of the beauties of it. It wasn't really resolved as an idea, but it was a vehicle to talk about. You know, talk about what that might be. So we took that a little further with this thing, which is a, a wooden phone, which you came with its own pot of wax that you could polish it, and it would, you know, but grow in time. It would take on the character of the user, um, and then and then we actually sort of produced a a, um, a, a model called the Papa phone out of uh, uh, American uh, walnut, uh, which we did sell some some of. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's that's basically the, the you know that's it. Hopefully that's that's clear and hopefully that's useful. I think I think as designers, once once you, I think once you get it, it's actually very it's very simple. And um, you know, I expect when I come back next year, then uh, you know, you guys will all be up on stage with your your world world changing projects, and uh, um, yeah, that'll be fun. Okay.